I believe it's, uh, it's also right for us to talk about prayer. Um, I plan for this next few weeks, even though we're going to do online worship, that we're going to talk about prayer. I believe this is something that we as believers needs to be, we need to be strong in this, deep in our prayer, established in our prayer life. Because there's two things in our, in our lives that's really most important as Christians. Uh, I would say this is at the, at the core of what we need to do on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And it's something truly you can do every moment unceasingly. And also a, a discipline that we are to be doing constantly every day, uh, faithfully, without, without fail. You know, that's why we are called disciples because the word disciple, its root word is the word discipline. And it means that there are things that we as Christians need to be constantly committed to, moment by moment, every day. And one of the things that we are to be committed to unceasingly, in fact, is prayer. That's how important it is. Because our power lies in the Lord God, and, and it's true, God has ordained prayer for Him to be able to work through us, accomplish things through us. And so we're going to talk about the importance of prayer and specifically prayer in the life of a, of a believer. So, and we're going to try to connect this with the situation we are in right now as well. And this is going to be a series of, of, of uh, I, things that I want to talk about. And today I want to talk about this one thing first, first uh, and the negative of this as well. But first, we're going to talk about prayer as a response to God's invitation. Prayer as a response to God's invitation. You know, it is God's desire. If you, if you go to Scripture, if you go to the Old Testament, New Testament, and there's verses after verses after Scripture after Scripture, it is God's desire for us to enjoy His presence. God wants us to enjoy His presence. He wants fellowship with us. He enjoys fellowship with us. And, and He wants us to enjoy that fellowship. You know, in, in the Old Testament, we find verses like, like th this is what Psalm 95 two says, let us come in His presence with thanksgiving. We, Jesus in the New Testament told us that we are to come to Him, all you who are weary or burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, we are reminded by Jesus that we are to come to Him. In fact, this is a command for us to come to Him if you are weary, burdened, and He'll give you rest. And also we are told in Hebrews that let us approach God, God's throne of grace with confidence. And also in James, we are told to draw near to God. So you know, this verse after verse, after verse, scripture after scripture, we are being told to draw near, approach Him, come to Him, come to His presence. Without a doubt, God wants us. He wants our fellowship. And He wants us to enjoy His presence. And prayer is a response to this invitation. This is a resp our response to God's invitation for Him, uh, His invitation for us to come to Him, to, 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 to join Him in fellowship. You know, in fellowship with the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are, we are encouraged or we are reminded by this scripture that, that the King of kings and Lord of lords is inviting us to himself. He's inviting us to himself. Now, if you go back to the ancient times, you know, the kings of the past, think, think of the kings of the Roman Empire or the emperors of the Roman Empire, the, the kings of the Persian or, or, uh, or the, the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire. You know, those kings were very powerful they, they had, they had uh, control over everything in their kingdom. And, and being in the presence of those kings, by the way, those ancient kings, for people, that was a great privilege. You know, except if you have uh, offended a king, of course. It's going to be the other way around. <laughs> either, either to lead to certain death or, or, or punishment or something that's uh, really bad. But, but, but if you found favor in the, with a king, it is, it's a great privilege to be with those kings. You know, the ancient, those ancient kings, they had all the resources at their disposal. You know, they owned the land, they owned pretty much everything in their, in, under their domain. 
Um, in fact, the declarations of those kings, the decrees of those kings were the law of the land. You know, unlike today, the world leaders, they, they, don't, they don't, in fact, make the laws or their words are not the law of the land. There's a different law that even the world leaders or, or political leaders or presidents obey, to obey, like in our country, the constitution. But back then, the law, the constitution was the word of the king himself. The word of the king was the law. And, and this reminds me uh, of Nehemiah. And I want to read this account uh, in, in, in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, starting with verse uh, 1 of chapter 2 to verse 9. And, and, and I want you to walk with me on this as we read this passage from the uh, ESV. Okay. In the month of Nisan, Nisan in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, he took up the wine and gave it to the king. king. I, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. So this is Nehemiah's account. Now I had not been sad in his presence. Next verse. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am in control. Okay. The king said to me, Why is your face sad? Seeing that you are not sick, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what? are you requesting what are you requesting so i prayed to the god of heaven and i said to the king if, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight that you send me to judah to the city of my father's graves that i may rebuild it and the king said to me and the queen sitting beside him how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the provinces beyond the river and that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he might give me timber to, to make beams for for, for the gates and fortress and of the fortress of the temple and, and for the wall of the city and all the house that I and the house that I shall occupy and the king granted me what I asked for 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 the good hand of God was upon me then I came to the gover governors of the provinces beyond the river and gave them the king's letters now the king had sent me officers of the army of the army and horsemen sent me with sent me with officers so there were uh, guards for Nehemiah so what is it can we, what what can we learn from this uh, passage in terms of prayer now, and I found something interesting about this passage you know talking about a king you know Nehemiah was simply a humble cup bearer that was his job uh, the cup bearer of the king of Persia this is the kind of this is the job description where you would die first you you might die in doing your job you know you'll, you'll be the first person to die if someone gives poison to the king you know that's a, that's a really difficult job right your your mission is to die in behalf of the king to give your life in behalf of the king you know, even though Nehemiah occupied a very humble position in the king's court, you know, being in the presence of the king is all that mattered in this situation. Given, given that, uh, you know, assuming he, he was not a, a, Christ, uh, a follower of God, but it was a blessing knowing that he is also a Jew and a follower of God, so that, that was such a blessing for him being in the, in the presence of the king. But Nehemiah, one thing you notice about him, he had a good relationship with the king and the queen. 
In fact, we can read from this, we can, uh, we can deduce from this passage that the king loved Nehemiah. The king and queen loved him and cared for him. You know, why would a king notice the sadness of a face of a servant? Normally, a king wouldn't care for that. He, had, he has a lot of servants, lots of uh, subjects. He would not care for this, this cup bearer at this level. But, but it's amazing that the king recognized Nehemiah's sadness. And one thing also interesting about the situation of Nehemiah being a cup bearer, he can talk to the king without all the protocols, without all the formalities. You know, for you to have a time with the king, an appointment with the king, you need to set an appointment. And there's probably a long line of people there before you. And, and there's a lot of probably security detail and to check, you know, if this guy is not a traitor or something. But Nehemiah, he can just talk to the king anytime. As he gives the king this cup or whatever wine, he can converse with the king whenever he wants. But the king noticed Nehemiah's sadness. And the king asked this question, what is it that you want? In, in a different translation, what is it that you want, Nehemiah? What are you requesting, Nehemiah? This question, this question that king, the king gave to Nehemiah, was, what is it that you want is, or what is it that you're requesting? It was an invitation for Nehemiah to ask, to ask something from the king. It was an invitation to ask. That must have been a, a, a wonderful experience for Nehemiah because if you read chapter 1, Nehemiah was really praying and asking God, God, grant me favor, oh God. He was, that was, chapter 1 is a prayer, uh, mostly a prayer, and, and asking God for blessing upon his, his, his heart's desire to see, you know, the, the, the restoration of his people, the restoration of Israel, because Israel was broken, was destroyed. Judah was destroyed by the, the nation of Israel. The, the, Judah was destroyed. And his people were in exile at this point in time in, in Persia. And so, this question by the king is, what is it that you want? Must have been something that's exciting for Nehemiah. And, and we can know, we know that the king, kings like Xerxes, these powerful kings back then, they had all the resources, especially with Xerxes. He had all the resources of the kingdom of Persia at his disposal to give to Nehemiah, to give what he needs, what Nehemiah needs, and to accomplish the things that Nehemiah wanted to accomplish, especially to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And you notice that Nehemiah gave a detailed request to the king, very detailed request. And Nehemiah did not hesitate to tell the king what he needed. Said everything that he needed to say. As believers, we are now in fellowship with God. You know, through Jesus Christ, we now are in fellowship with the Father. John says that in 1 John, that our fellowship is not only with Christ, but also with the Father. And, and, and it is through Christ. That's why we have fellowship with the Father. And, 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 and if we compare ourselves with this, with, with Nehemiah, we have more privilege than him. Nehemiah, this, Nehemiah was standing before the king as a cup bearer. But now in our relationship with God, we are standing before God as sons and daughters. That's even a greater privilege than a cup bearer before the king. Even a pagan king. And, 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 and to think, you notice in this passage, Nehemiah was praying to God before he answered because he feared for his life. Because he knew that these kings were not easy to deal with. They're, they're, you know, they have, they, probably they have certain kinds of personalities that if they get angry a little bit, it could off with your head. <laughs> you know, this is not a king that's easy to please. Might not be a good king, although in this case it looks like Xerxes and his wife were good, at least to Nehemiah. 
But for us, we serve a good and loving God. How much more for us as Christians? How much more for us? We serve the God who owns all the resources in the universe. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we know that he is infinitely good and loving. And this God is asking you, what is it that you want? What are you requesting? This is really what the Bible is saying when it says that we are to present our request before God. That we are to pour out our hearts to Him. God is simply asking you, what is it that you are you what is what is it that you're asking? What is it that you want? And clearly in this passage, Nehemiah presented his request. He knew exactly what he wanted. He even gave a detailed description of what he wanted. You notice that? It's very detailed and, and very clear. He was very, it was very clear what he wanted. It was not vague. It was very clear. You know, sadly today, the prayers of believers today are not well taught out. Sometimes it's not wholehearted. You know, in our prayers, sometimes we waste words. You don't waste your words before a king. When you're standing before a king, every word must count. Every second must count. And I believe prayer must be the same. That everything we say must count. There's no empty praises, no empty words there. I know we, we, when we go back to the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus, uh, prior to the Lord's Prayer, rebuked the, the practices where people prayed, uh, you know, mindless prayers, uh, you know, like the pagans. But Christians, we have the tendency to be like that when we pray without, without, without being wholehearted in our prayers, without thinking what we're saying. You know, I think kailangan pag-iisipan talaga natin maigi. I think that's the, how you say it in Tagalog, pag-iisipan. Na may, maigi talaga kung anong, what you need to say. You need to really think hard. What am I going to say to God? What am I going to ask? It has to be well thought out. You know, God is not against planning what you're going to say to Him. God is not against that. You know, like Nehemiah, when he came before God in prayer and when he came before the king, I don't think he thought about these things at that very moment, right? It, these were things that he already considered way before talking to the king. He already thought what he wanted. And before he even said a word to the king, I believe our prayers must be the same. We need to think hard, consider what we're going to say. You know, Jesus' prayers, for instance, were very short. Most of them... Most of his prayers, the Lord's prayer can be prayed in less than a minute. And think of the prayers, uh, that's, uh, at least the prayers that were public that we know about. Of course, he spent whole nights in prayers. Or probably the, it was during the time that he prayed really, really long prayers. Like uh, spending whole night in prayer or even 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness praying. But, but his public prayers and the prayers that people hear him pray are very short. And the prayers that he describes to people are often very short. And why is that? Because his prayers are very clear. It's very direct. You, you know what he wants, what he's asking for. Let me give you one simple example. You know, when Simon was, was, was uh, when Peter told Simon Peter that Satan is going to test you, Peter. He's going to demand to have you and he might sift you like wheat. You know, Jesus is warning Peter that Time is going to come soon. That you're gonna, your faith is going to be tested, Peter. It's going to be tested. And really tested hard, like, like wheat being sift. And, 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 and then this is what Jesus said. This, is, this gives you insight into his own prayer life, but how Jesus prays. He said, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. Your faith will not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That's very direct and very clear what Jesus is asking his father. That, that Peter, that when you go through this trial, when you go through this uh, situation where he's going to deny Jesus late in a few moments after this, a few, yeah, not too, too long after this, he says, 
I pray that your faith will not fail. That you will not be like Judas who just hanged himself. That you'll, you're not going to be someone who's just going to give up on me because you have failed. You will, your faith will not fail. You will be able to stand again. And once you have stood, it says there, strengthen your brothers. It's a very clear prayer. I pray that Peter's faith will not fail, that he will be able to stand afterwards, and that afterwards he will be able to strengthen and encourage his brothers. Isn't that amazing prayer? It's just bang, bang, bang. Very, very clear. Jesus knew what he was asking for. He, doesn't, he didn't need to make that prayer very long. It's a prayer that's well thought out. And I believe that's how we should be praying as well. This is how we respond to a king's invitation to ask. To ask something from him. We need to be more respectful and reverent in our prayer. You know, our tendency to not think what we're saying in our prayers is, is not a respectful thing. If you talk to someone and you just mumble things without really thinking what you're saying, that's very disrespectful, right? How much more for God? Now, we really need to think what we're saying before him. More respectful, reverent, and a, a greater you know, view of what prayer is. Uh, Spurgeon once said, he said, True prayer, the resources of God in heaven and earth is at your disposal. The resources of God, both in heaven and in earth, is at your disposal. R. A. Tori also said these words. He said, There are things in life that God can only bring to pass through prayer. Meaning there are things in life, it can only happen if you pray can only happen to prayer. If you're not going to pray, that's not ever going to happen. I, I, I agree with that quote because if you, uh, if you go back to that passage that Ariel quoted earlier in Second Chronicles 7, you know, if you look at the context of that passage, this was actually Solomon here. And, and this was the time of the, I believe this was around the time the temp, the, of the temple dedication. And, and and Israel had gone through, in the past, had gone through calamities and, and, you know, drought, famine. But this is what God told Solomon at this point. He said, if, 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 if Israel, if the nation of Israel is going to go through calamities or going to go through famine or drought or locusts, devouring the crops or pestilence or sickness or plague, you know, he mentioned three things there. I'm just expanding on that. God gave him certain conditions for him to respond. God says I, there's, there are certain conditions, Solomon, that Israel needs to be and needs to do for him to respond to, that, to, to their needs, to their prayer. And this is the condition that God wants, uh, for the condition of God and what he wants the people of Israel to be and to do. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, talking about his own people, Israel, he said, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God gave certain conditions. And one of these conditions is pray. Of course, a prerequisite to prayer is to humble ourselves. Then pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Talking about repentance. Only then God will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. But if they're not willing to do this, this is not going to happen. The healing is not going to happen. The forgiveness is not going to happen. You know, people often say, God... You know, why are you allowing all these bad things in the world? If you are really a good God, why are there calamities in, the, in this world? Why are there bad things in this world? Why are there bad things? You know, why, why are there many bad things in my life? Why is this calamity happen, happening right now? Why is this pestilence or this, this pandemic is happening right now, Lord God? Why are nations affected by this? If you are really a good God, 
why are you allowing this to happen? You can answer your that you can answer that question now. Why is this happening? Have we asked ourselves? Are we humbling ourselves before God? Are we praying? Are we seeking his face? Are we turning away from our wicked ways? It's easy for us to blame God and tell God, God, why are you doing this? But we are not meeting God's conditions for him to, to heal us. The world is not meeting God's conditions for healing. He said he will, he, he will hear, of course. He will forgive our sins, of course. He will heal our land. He wants to do that. But he said, I have something, things that I want you to do first. I have things that I want you to do first. If you go through scripture in the New, you know, New Testament passages, Jesus tells us to ask, seek, and knock, to present our request, to pour out our hearts. This is God telling us, come to me, and only then I will respond to you. In fact, in, in, uh, in, in James, we are told, I, I don't know if I had a passage here, no, later on. I, do I have James? No, not, not that James. Yeah. The other James. <laughs> other passage. Says that draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So the, 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 so the message that I have for you, those who are listening online and those who are here in the church, are you humbling yourself before God? Are you humble before God? Are you praying? Pray, seeking his face and turning from your wicked ways. Repentance, repentance. And I believe this is what God wants us to do today in this situation. In fact, if you look at this passage, if my people, this refers to the people of Israel. And who are the people of God today? Who are the people of God today? The church. The church is commanded to humble himself, herself. We are commanded as a church to humble ourselves. I know we cannot expect the people of the world to humble themselves because they're lost. Without Christ, they need the gospel. They need the gospel. We cannot expect people of the world to pray because they're not going to seek God by their own wisdom and strength. It takes, it takes the Holy Spirit for them to be able to pray. So this message, this, this word here is really for us, the church. Because we're the ones who has the ability to pray. We have the Spirit of God that gives us the heart of humility. And we are the ones who are able to understand and know God, to seek His face. So this is for us as a church. And in closing, I'm going to give the other point, And this is going to be a shorter point, And we're going to end soon. The opposite is not praying is a reproach to God. A reproach to God. It is something that God disagrees with. It's something that does not look good in the sight of God if we do not pray. Think about this. God is asking you, what do you want? What is it that you want? Asking you, what are you requesting? God is telling you, come to me. And you're going to say, and, and if I'm going to ask you, are you going to respond to God's invitation? You're going to say, of course, I'll, I'm going to respond when God asks me. I'll, I, God asks me, um, what is it that you want? And you're going to say, of course. I'm going to say, Lord, I will respond. I will respond. But the reality is we're not responding. <laughs> we're not responding. Many Christians are not even giving five minutes of focus time in prayer before God. Some say that I'm too busy, I don't, I, don't wanna get, I, I don't have time. Some say I don't have the desire or motivation to pray. Or some people, some believe, even Christians, don't even know how to pray for more than 30 minutes or even 30 minutes. They already struggle, Lord, what am, what am I going to say? 30 minutes is very long for prayer. It's sad, right? In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we remember Jesus Ask his disciple to, to stay with him, to pray with him for one hour. One hour. 
and it's a reproach, it's actually a sin if you're not praying. It's sin. You know why? This is what James says. Whoever knows the right thing to do but fails to do it for him, it is sin. If you know that prayer is what God commanded you to do, if you know prayer is something that you supposed to do on a day-to-day basis, moment by moment that we are to pray unceasingly. No. This are, there are many commands in Scripture for us to pray. If we're not faithfully praying or not praying at all, it is sin. It is sin. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective and and if you are not faithful in the commitments that you have for God, it is sin. And, and it's not going to be a blessing to your, to, to, your, to your prayer life as well. Because God is not going to respond to a heart that's, that's sinful, of course. You're, you might be thinking, Al, how can this be? I, I, I don't really think that God is going to consider prayer not praying as a sin that's that doesn't that that somehow that's not a bad thing for god to just uh, for me to just ignore prayer maybe just god can just overlook it but think about the situation you have a close friend who wholeheartedly wanted to invite you to her house and to spend time with her and this friend keeps on telling you, hey, come to me, uh, visit me. I'm going to prepare a great dinner for you. Text you, send you an email, drop by your office and put a card on your desk and say, hey, this is, come to my house at this time. And, and, and even, even, even sent you a snail mail. And let's have a dinner together, an appointment. And you never responded. You never said anything. You got the message, but you never said anything. What will your friend think of you? What, your, what will your friend feel, right? It's going to be hurtful for that person. And she's going to be offended. Or maybe, I don't know. Might question your friendship, your concern, your love for her. It's not going to be a good thing, right? For your relationship. God is inviting us to come to him, calling us to come to him. Just like that, that, bank, that rich man having a banquet, calling people, hey, come to my banquet, come to my banquet. But people rejected the invitation. When we are not praying, we are rejecting God's invitation to come to him. If we truly know how to pray, if we truly learn to pray, like the way Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah asked King Xerxes, you know, even an hour of prayer with God, even two hours of prayer with God is not long. You, you notice our prayer meeting? Our plan, my plan initially was just to finish in one hour or something or less. We spent two hours every time in our prayer meeting. It's easy to spend two hours in prayer because you know what you're asking for. And we are asking for the things that the Bible tells us to ask. Holiness, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of his word, you know, wisdom, uh, burden for the gospel, people that they need, uh, salvation of the lives of the lost, you know, uh, reaching out to, the, to our family and friends who are lost. We're praying for those things. Two hours is not enough. <laughs> Kulang pa, di ba? Kulang pa. So I encourage all of you who are, who are online, um, you know, when, when this COVID uh, thing is going to go away, let's come here to the church Saturday afternoon night at 6, 6 p.m. And, and let's pray together. And I, I pray that those who came here for our prayer at the time it was a, a blessed experience for you, you know, that, that we spent a solid two hours of prayer. Just prayer. I like to get another quote from Art A. Tori in closing. Prayer brings God's power into our work. Therefore, prayer is work itself. 
It's not a waste of your time. It's not something, some people criticize those who pray and say, oh, ikaw, dasal nanda salang. Ako, I'll do, I'll do work while you, you just, you're just wasting your time in prayer. Prayer itself is work. You are accomplishing things for God in prayer. Like the one, the quote we just mentioned last time, half of my work is done on my knees. Half of the work that you're, you're going to accomplish was already accomplished when you were on your knees praying. Amen? And I believe it's even more than half. That's just a good say in the quote. But, but I believe it's still far more than half when you really give in your heart in prayer. Maybe God will accomplish 100% of your work on your knees, right? Amen. And I truly believe that as we, as we face this, this tribulation, pestilence, as the Bible calls it, as, or as the world calls it, pandemic, as Christians, there's nothing else we can do. Think about it. What else can you do? Run around Costco, find a lot of stuff, hoard a lot of stuff, or hide in a bunker or something. Or buy an airplane and just fly in the skies the whole time until the pandemic is over? Or go to an island? I don't think we have the money to even have an island or a piece of land on a nice island or something. Hmm? And we can be all survivors, isolated from the, I was telling Rela uh, early, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, hermits, uh, is it hermit, right? Yeah, they're, 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 it's favorable for them <laughs> because they're antisocial, they're hidden from society, so they're going to live the longest probably <laughs> in the situation. But the thing is, we cannot live like that, right? We cannot live like that. And even how much we, we, we try to put all this protection upon ourselves, whether alcohol by, or, or, or sanitizer or everything, or, or mass or something. <laughs> There's only so much we can do. There's only so much we can do. We cannot even trust our own selves. We cannot even trust others. We cannot fully trust everyone and the government and everything. Yes, we do our best. They do our best. And we, as much as possible, we, we put our confidence in what they're doing. They still make mistakes, and we still make mistakes. And we fail sometimes. We fail to, to put, wash our hands sometimes and put our finger in our face or something. <laughs> the only person we can fully trust 100%, and you know, we know he can deliver, and he can answer our needs, is our Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's why our, our, not our last resort, but our, always our first resort is to come to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Amen. So let us close our time in prayer. And this is the first time in our, in our seven years as a church that I'm not gonna, we're not going to pray for food. <laughs> that this has never happened ever in the past. <laughs> no, we don't have food today. <laughs> Let's come to the Lord and humble ourselves before him. Let me just kneel down before God. Our Father in heaven, Lord. Lord, we come to you, Lord. Knowing in our hearts, oh God, that, that we are sinners, God. Simply, all because, but simply saved by you, saved by your grace and by your mercy. And that you have made us right before your sight through your son, Jesus Christ. That through his blood we've been cleansed, Lord. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Lord. And we are humbling before you, O oh God, asking you for your grace and your mercy, O oh God, for this situation that's, in, that's happening around us today, Lord. Your grace and your mercy upon our families, O oh God. And upon our church, O oh God, Lord, we ask for your divine protection, Lord, upon your people. 
we just read Psalm 91 earlier, Lord, and you, you, you have made a promise in those words, in those in, that, in your word, O oh God, that Lord, your people are, are being protected by you. You promise to protect your people, Lord. Lord, we hold on to that promise, Lord, that you protect us, Lord, in this situation, as well as our families, Lord. But Lord, our heart cry for the Christ for the people of the world, Lord. Because Lord, without you in their lives, O oh God, life is uncertain for them, Lord. They do not know your will. They do not know your purpose, O oh God. And Lord, their lives are not being led by the Holy Spirit. For only those who are the sons of daughters of God that are being led by the Spirit, Lord. But the people of the world, O oh God, they are not being led by you, Lord by the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray for them, Lord God, that you reach out to them, Lord. Take hold of their lives, O oh God, and bring them to yourself, O oh God. Lord, we come to you in behalf of them, that you bring salvation to those who are lost, especially among us today in this community, Lord, that you have called us to minister to, Lord. Lord, as, as Marvin has prayed earlier, Lord God, bring about a revival within the church, an awakening in the city, O oh God. The Lord, through this pandemic, Lord, people, Lord God, will open their eyes to you, their hearts to you, Lord God, will be receptive to the gospel, O oh God. And that, Lord, we as Christians will be bold and courageous, O oh God, to share your word. No, we will not be ashamed, that we will not hesitate, Lord, that we will have the boldness and courage, O oh God of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, to speak your word. And we will speak, Lord, with your wisdom, Lord, and in the words that you provide us, Lord. Lord, I know that every circumstance like this that happens in the world, O oh God, Lord, I know that this is without purpose, O oh God. You have a purpose for this, and you are able to use this, O oh God, for your greater glory, Lord. That, Lord, it may look gloomy and and gloom and, and Lord, hopeless from the eyes of many, O oh God, and many are anxious, O oh God. But Lord, I truly believe, Lord, that great things can come out of this, O oh God, especially for your kingdom and for your glory, Lord God, because that's where you're most concerned in this world, Lord. It is for your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, it is your will that all men will be saved. And so, Lord, save people that's around us, the communities that we represent, Lord, the Filipino community of Austin, Lord. I pray that you bring salvation to this community, Lord. Lord, and let this church, let the members of this church, let our light so shine, O oh God, that this community will see your glory, O oh God, through our lives, O oh God, that they will come to know Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, O oh God. And Lord, there are many communities also that our church represents, the Mexican-American communities, uh, the Vietnamese community, Lord, even the Korean community in this city, Lord. Lord, we are represented in this church. The different cultures are being represented in this church. And Lord, I pray also for salvation, O oh God, upon those communities, O oh God. And use us as a church, O oh God. Use this church, O oh God. And Lord, I pray that you bring about this revival, Lord God. And an awakening among people, O oh God, in this city, O oh God, for the gospel, Lord. Lord, this is our prayer, Lord. Lord, this is a big request, O oh God. But Lord, it is your heart, O oh God, to show us greater things, O oh God. It is your desire for us to experience greater things than what we, we, we can think of or imagine, O oh Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask you, Lord God, to do this in the city of Austin, Lord, where you have called us to minister, Lord. And, Lord, strengthen every church, strengthen every congregation that us, us people in droves come to you, Lord, and, and surrender their lives to you. We have churches around the city who are willing to make disciples, to care for these this lives. And I pray for our church that you prepare us, O oh God, for this task to make disciples that each one of us, Lord, will be caring for a life, the life of a new believer, Lord, nurturing them in the faith, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask this from you, Lord God, that you prepare our church for the harvest, O oh God, 
And Lord, send more laborers, raise up more laborers, and raise up every member of this church to be laborers for the harvest, O oh God. Lord, that everything we do, Lord, as a church, the sermon, the life groups, the discipleship, all the teaching ministries, whether it's through our Sunday school, youth, and young adult, Lord, it is to prepare, Lord God, people for the work of the harvest because this is where your heart is, O oh God. And Lord, if we fail to do this as a church, in times past, Lord, let this be different this time, Lord. Let this be different for our church, O oh God. That now, Lord, we'll be a church that reaches out truly to those who are lost and fulfill the task of making disciples, Lord. Lord God, thank you, Jesus, for your presence today, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for bringing comfort upon our church. And I pray for comfort and peace that people who are listening, even all of us here, we will not be anxious of anything, Lord, but by prayer and supplication, present our request to God. Lord, instead of being anxious, Lord, we will kneel down before you, cry out before you, and pour our hearts before you, Lord. Lord God, grant us your peace. Grant us your protection. And grant us discernment and direction in what we're going to do in the next several weeks, Lord. Or even maybe months, Lord. As a church, as, as families and individuals, Lord. We need your direction and your leading, Lord. Help me also, Lord. And help the leaders of this church as we make certain decisions, Lord. What we're going to do moving, for, moving forward as a ministry, Lord. Lord, thank you. For everything and your wisdom that you're going to give us, Lord. And may your grace and your peace, O oh God, feel us through and through, Lord, as we, as we leave this place and as we end our time in worship today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.